Because we went out on the circuit a bit, w not with Traffic Tansy, but w with our wrestling consultant. Yes. So we went to a number of matches, and it was fun. But, you know, you saw the, the guys in the ring, and you saw the wham, the clotheslines, and the falls. And then afterwards, you saw them walk back to their cars in the parking lot. And it was a different body that moved to oh the yeah. car in the parking lot than, than actually was on, on stage doing that. I mean, well, our you coach could tell that they, they oh were feeling. Oh, they hurt. Our coach <laughs> was Sandor Kovacs, who wrestled as the great Sandor. And he was in the days of Whipper Billy Watson and that. And these were all guys who were 190, 200 pounds. They, they were not these massive uh, guys in those days. And uh, both of Sandor's knees were gone, totally gone. You know, they took the beatings. Oh. So I guess wrestlers like dancers are Shh. done by the time they're 35, 40. Oh, most of them are. Work. Most of them are, yeah. So you, gone, you went from the root of theatricality, which I call the wrestling ring, yep. um, to academe. Uh, and well, you went and did there was a short detour, a short detour there. Uh, but you did a PhD, yes? Uh, I came within two chapters of it. Two chapters of it. Two chapters of it. Uh, yeah, I was. And what took you to? What interested me? What took you to the academic stream? Uh, okay, having so come from the wrestling. Yeah, <laughs> let me. <laughs> the theatrical so stream. So I went out of the wrestling, and I had a radio show on CJON uh, on Friday afternoons. 5.30 to 6, called Waxing with Waldo. And I played all the new stuff, all the Little Richard, Elvis Presley, it was all coming. And I wanted to be a radio person. And uh, I, in grade 11, decided that I was going to go to Ryerson, take radio and television arts. So I went to my father, and I said, Dad, uh, this is what I'd like to do. I had pulled up my marks and that, and my dad said, uh, radio announcer. Well, what'll happen to you at the age of 40? You'll have nothing. No, no. You got to do something more substantial than that. Well, in the Ryerson calendar at that time, the very first thing was business administration. So I thought, I'll go up and get in business administration, but halfway through the year, I'll switch over. So I went back to my father and I said, got it, business administration. He said, that's a good idea. Business administration, yes. Pick some other place to go. And I said, why? He said, well, you'll get up there and you'll switch over to radio and television arts. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, that's what I do. So I went to talk to my mentor, Charlie, uh, in, uh, at, the at my school in the master's com room, and there was a, a calendar for the University of New Brunswick on the desk there, and I picked it up and looked at it, and they had business administration. They also had an indoor swimming pool. I thought, oh my God. So I went to my father and I said, okay, this is what I want to do. And he said, all right, go ahead and do it. So he guaranteed that as long as I kept up, he'd give me $125 a month. So I went to UMB and I bored it and I hated it. I hated it. And uh, I went back to see Charlie Grant at Christmas and said, I'm not going back, Charlie. And Charlie, I mean, teachers couldn't do this now, but he grabbed me, threw me up against the wall, and he said, oh, you little suck. You're homesick. You're homesick. He said, look, go back there. There's got to be something that you can do up there. You used to be interested in dramatics and that when they were, you were in school here and that. He said, there must be something up there. So out of fear, I went back, and I saw an audition notice for the UNB Drama Society. And I said, I'm seven year rich, I think it was. So I went and I auditioned. There was a, a man and a student and a girl there. Did the audition, went away. A couple of days later, I got called back. Went in and did the audition again. And I got a small part. And Alvin Shaw, who became a great mentor of mine, said, um, I'll see you in the boiler room of the Lady Beefbrook residence, 8 o'clock Saturday morning. I thought, what in the name of God is this about? Turned out. This is where they washed the flats. In those days, remember, we used to do the powder-based paint and reuse the flats. And he, if you wanted to act with the UNB Drama Society, you also had to do lights, you had to do, you had to do everything. That became my school. That became my school, and Alvin became my great mentor. So I was doing business administration and didn't like it. And every Thursday, I would be in the reading room of the Beaver Book Library and there was this beautiful, beautiful girl, about three doors down, and I would look at her, 
I kept wanting to get up and introduce myself. And one day I did. And she got up and she was leaving. So I followed her. She went across the street into the Forester building, up to the second floor. I saw her go in. The classrooms had a, a door at the front and a door at the back. She went in the front. I went in the back. And I sat there. And this old gentleman came in with a lovely little beard, bald head, wearing an academic gown. And it was Professor R. E. D. Catley, who was the university orator and head of classics. And he announced that he always wore his gown whenever he delivered a lecture on Plato. I was hooked. I went back to his class, never saw the girl again. Went back to his class for months until he finally stopped me and he said, you're not in this class, are you? And I said, no, I said, but I'm. He said, well, if you're interested in this, you should be taking this other course from Dr. Millen, Classics in Translation. You don't speak Latin or Greek, do you? I said, no. He said, well, you should be taking those. I did. I went to, uh, went to the, uh, the head of the business department and said, can I switch? And he said, no. So I carried uh, a load, just doing it out of interest. And the next year, the new head of philosophy, WFM Stewart, was there. And he came to me and he said, I understand you're interested in philosophy. You will take these courses. I will speak to the dean. And I did. And uh, did philosophy, did my BA, my MA. And uh, as we were coming up to my MA, he said, learning, you've got to go on and get your doctorate. And you're applying for a Commonwealth scholarship. And I said, oh, I am? He said, yes. So I did. So I got a Commonwealth scholarship, and I could go to St. Andrews, Cambridge, or Australian National University. And Dr. Stewart, who was from Scotland, said, well, you're not going to St. Andrews. That's too much like Newfoundland. You can't go to Cambridge because we can't have a philosophy department with somebody named Learning and somebody named Wisdom. John Wisdom was the head of the department. He said, you're going to Australia. The real reason was Dr. John Passmore was the head of the institute there, and he was in the field that I was in. So I went to Australia to do a thesis on the concept of natural law in the works of Grotius, Hooker, and Hobbes. Now, wait a Soon minute. Soon to be on a bestseller I got list. a guy who was just <laughs> elbowed in the wrestling ring in St. John's uh, and went down. And now I have a guy who goes to Australia to do uh, a, a PhD in philosophy. All because of mentors. All because of mentors. All my life I've been blessed by having people who, for some reason or other, pushed me in, in some way, you know. I came back and can tell you this very quick. My father had a grade five education. He was a plumbing and heating contractor, played the banjo. Wonderful, wonderful man. I came back in my second year, having done a full year now of philosophy. And let me tell you, I was the smartest guy that you'd ever met. And my dad invited me down to his office for a drink. Hey, I'm feeling pretty on top of it all now, so we're having a drink. And he's asking me how it's going and wondering, I'm, I'm telling them, you know, God Almighty, you know, when you deal with Plato, <laughs> you, you deal with the concept of the cave and you're really you know, examining the such and such and then you bump into this problem and he says, have another. So, oh, thank you. And, says, another. And, I says, and I go on and on. He lets me go on and on. I said, you know, and there's the problem. And Dad looks at me and he says, well, I think if you look at book five of the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, you'll find that he addresses that. I couldn't even spell Nicomachean. There's my father with a great five education. 